It's good to have everybody join us this hour. The great silence in heaven. The great silence in heaven. Revelation chapter 8, verses 1 through 7. Revelation chapter 8, verses 1 through 7. The great silence in heaven. The Bible tells us, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. Your word have I stored in my soul that I may not sin against you. Sanctify them with your word, for your word is the truth. Grass withers, flower fades, but the word of God will abide forever. Let us bow our heads as we ask God to sanctify our time together. Holy God, we want to thank you for your love, for your mercies, for your kindness. We want to thank you for all that you do for us. Thank you for creating this opportunity for us to assemble ourselves for the purpose of learning your word, the word of life. We pray that God, the Holy Spirit, will take the portion that belongs to us and bless us abundantly. This is my prayer in Christ's name. Amen. I just want to, uh, uh, we do receive letters from, uh, from people around the world. And uh, I just want to share a few of these letters so that you can see how you are prayers and uh, whatnot, how you are, uh, your participation with uh, GM ministry is really paying dividends. And this one, this letter came from uh, the Texas Department, Department of Criminal Justice. It says, my name is Chaplain XYZ. I am one of the chaplains at the Texas Department of Criminal Justice. This facility houses over 3,200 Texas prisoners. I'm writing your ministry today to humbly request a complimentary donation of 20 of each of the books by Moses Siongubiko. If possible, or whatever amount you are able, the inmates and the security staff really enjoy reading them. The book. The booklet titles are Biblical Doctrine of Salvation, Comfort in Suffering, Disaster, God's One in Bell, Focus on Christian Marriage, Forgiveness by Confession Alone, Giving an Integral Part of Worship, Overview of God's Grace, Science and Wonder, Spirituals, Gift of Thanks, What is the Spiritual Life? Thank you for taking the time to prayerfully consider my request, and I hope to hear from your ministry at your convenience you are in our prayers. You are in our prayers. And of course, our ministry, once we receive such requests, we do not hesitate. We don't waste time. We package the books as requested and send them to them. Uh, GM sends hundreds, if not thousands of books to prisons across the United States, and God is using it, using those books to change lives. Another another letter uh, is was addressed, dear Grace Evangelistic Ministries, Mr. Mosi Songubiko. Wow, I just read your book, Joseph, a Pillar of Grace. I loved it so much. What great theology and true exposition of Scripture. I'm a student of theology and found the pages so well spoken and doctrine put into a very useful way and on point. In a day of sugar, I exegesis, the exegesis of Moses' expository of biblical text was a delight. Please send me more. I am sharing with everyone I can. And he listed the books he wanted the ministry to send him. Another uh, similar letter K 
came from uh, another individual who also is blessed by the teaching of the ministry. And he said, I am writing to thank you for the book, Joseph, A Pillar of Grace. I, am a, I ran across it and read it twice. So I didn't miss a word. I really enjoyed the book and devoured every scripture. I would really appreciate it if you, if you would accommodate my spiritual work with these spiritual books. Thank you for your time and may the Lord bless your ministry abundantly. We receive these letters via email, post, and as people get across the materials that the Lord use or uses to enlarge or bless them. The great silence in heaven, Revelation chapter 8, verses 1 through 7. I have read the Bible, I don't know how many times, Genesis to Revelation. I have not seen a passage where there was silence in heaven. Heaven is known to be a place of great joy, a commotion, if you would. Heaven is a place where angels worship God, uh, holy, 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 holy God Almighty. It's a place of, like we've seen, uh, great singing and praises. There is great joy, even when a person believes in Christ, There's, you find uh, commotion in heaven just for a, a soul that believes in Christ. And of course, many souls believe every by the hour, uh, by the hour. And that tells you heaven is a place of great joy, not a place of silence until this moment. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 8, beginning from verse 1. And when he broke the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And I saw the seven angels as, who stand before God, and even and seven trumpets were given to them. And another angel came and stood at the altar, holding a golden censer, and much incense was given to him that he might add it to the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints went up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and he filled it with the fire of the altar and threw it to the earth. And there followed prose of thunder and sounds and flashes of lightning and earthquake. And the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound them. And the first sounded and there came hell and fire mixed with blood and they were thrown to the earth. And the third of the earth was burned up and a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. Like I said, this is a, an awful moment in the history of mankind. What we're seeing here, we just read these seven verses. It's showing clearly the implication of the of what will be taking place when the church is removed from the planet Earth, when the church is removed from the planet Earth. I have paused, I read that passage many times. I have paused to reflect on the silence. And I want, I want to take you to heaven with me. Yeah. So let's go to heaven in, in our mind. 
pretend to be in heaven with John, the apostle, and let's just be. We have been in places where silent prayer is called. Sometimes during the play, uh, play games, maybe a prominent person died or something happened in the, in the, in the country. Uh, and before they start play or start anything, they call for silent prayer, usually for 10 seconds or 15 seconds. Silent prayer where they, you find complete and total decorum in the environment. But here in heaven, 30 minutes of silence. 30 minutes. In, 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 in the scheme of internal state, it may not look, appears much 30 minutes. But uh, you, you know, if, if I'm teaching you right now, if I stop teaching you, and if I pause for 10 minutes and you're just looking at me, it will look to you like it's eternity. If I just stop talking now for 10 minutes, and you're just looking at me, I'm not saying a word. You wonder what's going on. You it will appear. It will appear as it's never ending journey. So 30 minutes in heaven seem to be a lot. But I have pondered, reflected, I want, I want you to reflect with me. And I want you to be in heaven with me at the same time so we can capture this. I want, to, I, want to, I want to transfer you to the atmospheric mode of heaven so we can capture this uh, action in heaven. So be there and participate in this silence. Silence. Complete and total silence. No movement. God even refused worship. God refused to accept praise. And he called for silence. The entire angelic being stood still. No movement. That reminded us we had so, so, such a silence in the book of Job when his friends visited him. They saw how devastated situation Job was, how Job was uh, torn apart physically, how Everything Job had was sent into ruination. They were dumbfounded when they arrived, speechless, totally flabbergasted. They couldn't say a word. They were, they were silent for seven days. But here, the entire heaven came to a screeching halt for 30 minutes, 30 minutes. So I reflected. And uh, why is the pause? First of all, when we remember when we finished chapter six, the, seven, the, six, the six seals, when the six seals were opened, there was a pause. A, Chapter seven was kind of a parenthesis, a parenthetical chapter was inserted before we get to chapter eight. There was a pause. It wasn't all along, everything was taking place. First seal was open, second seal was open, third seal, but when it, when it came to the sixth seal, after the sixth seal, we were waiting for the seventh seal to be opened. There was a pause. A chapter was brought in. God held back what was happening. He held back the, the wrath. He held back what the wrath he was pouring on the earth. So I reflected, why now? This seventh seal, the finally we got the seventh seal. And I will be, I'm sure you'll be anxious to know what is in the content. As John was anxious to find out what was in that scroll that was broken. 
Suddenly there was silence. And uh, I came up with four, four reasons why this silence. Four important reasons why this silence. One, to show God's long suffering in judgment. To show God's long suffering in judgment. God does not take pleasure in judging the saints. God does not take pleasure in judging the world. God doesn't take pleasure in judging anyone. He doesn't take pleasure in our pain and suffering. And that's why he gives us time. That's what we call long suffering. He gives us time to repent, to change our ways, to change our state. Whenever we are in error, he gives us time because he doesn't take pleasure. He gives us warning. He warns us many times before he zooms in and brings about his discipline on mankind. Look at Second Chronicles. That, that was true of the nation Israel and Judah. Second Chronicles 36. Turn with me to Second Chronicles 36. We will see that God does not take pleasure in, in the pain of his creatures. Second Chronicles 36, verse 15. And the Lord, the God of their fathers, sent word to them again and again. <laughs> underline, underline that. Again and again. He sent word again and again. By his messengers, by his messengers, not just one messenger. The same way he's sending his word to the world, by his messengers, that's us. Those who bring the word of God to mankind, they are God's messengers. In the context here, by his prophets, because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. He had compassion on the people of Judah. He had compassion on Jerusalem. But, you see, verse 16, but they continually mocked the messengers of God, despised his words, and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people, until there was no remedy. And there comes a time when God will warn us, even in our spiritual life, God will warn us of the path that we take. God will warn us of the life we are living. God will warn us on the many things that are happening in our lives. God will keep warning us using so many circumstances to warn us. He may use sickness to warn us. He may use uh, lack of employment to warn us. He may use uh, Bankruptcy to warn us. He may use so many things to warn us, to get our attention. And there comes a time when if we keep resisting his warning, he will have no recourse but to, lo to lower the boom of justice upon us. That's what we read in Second Chronicles verse 36, verse 15 through 16. Second Peter 3 9 tells us the same thing. Second Peter 3 9, God is not willing, God is not anxious, it's not desiring that anyone should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It speaks of the it speaks of God's long suffering. We want to see the character of this God we are worshiping, the character of this God we have called the, the one we call our father. And number two. The second reason, it reveals God's pain in punishment. It reveals God's pain in punishment. Why was there silence? One, God is a God of long suffering. And he, he, God knows what was coming on the earth. And so there was silence. 
as he sees the agony, the pain that he will inflict upon mankind. There was silence in heaven. Everyone in heaven took part in that silence as they reflect on the coming judgment of the great God. So the second reason, again, God's pain in punishment is revealed. God has tremendous pain when we are punished and when we go through difficult times. Turn with me to Lamentation chapter 3, verse 33. Lamentation 3, 33. Lamentation 3, 33. God doesn't take there. Uh, Jeremiah tells us, Lamentation 3, 33, for he does not afflict willingly. For he does not afflict willingly. Or grieve the sons of men. Or grieve the sons of men. God does not afflict willingly or grieve the sons of men. In other words, he doesn't take pleasure in our pain and suffering, in our pain and suffering. The same thing he said in Hebrews 12, 10, for they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them, but he, God, disciplines us for our own good that we may share his holiness. Even in his discipline, he, th he doesn't take pleasure. He only applies it because he knows it is necessary to get us where we need to be. The third reason of the silence, it shows the unprecedented nature of God's impending wrath. The third reason, it reveals or shows the unprecedented nature of God's impending wrath. Hebrews 10.31, it is a very fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. It is a very fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. The fourth, why I think the silence was, the silence shows that his justice will ultimately prevail. His justice will ultimately prevail. If God had another way, I, I, I believe he could just bypass this wrath upon his creatures. But he didn't. He doesn't. He doesn't have another way except to inflict the pain that balances his justice. The same way, if God had another way of providing salvation without uh, displaying his son, putting him to sh open shame, he would have. If there was another way of providing salvation for you and I, without Christ coming in the human nature as God and being put to that shame, no wonder why the son of God himself wept bitterly, and he he prayed fervently in Gethsemane, hoping that he would just close his eyes and open them. Zam, there's another 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 way came, but he knew there wasn't another way. That's why he said, "Not my will, but thy will be done. Not my will, but your will be done." By and by, the justice of God will come forth. People who think, people who, people who tell you, well, God is so loving, he's so kind. He, how can he throw his loving child to the lake of fire? Those people have no clue, no understanding about the justice of God or his character. God is a God of love, no doubt about it. He's equally a God of justice. In the, in the scheme of God's integrity, in the scheme of God uh, being, Justice balances love. Justice balances love. Love does not 
take precedent over justice. In his love, he has provided salvation for mankind to escape his wrath. In his love, he has given mankind long, a, a, a long rope so that the individual can turn to him and experience his grace and mercy to the maximum. And that's love. Love brought Christ to the cross. Love did everything. Love brought people to evangelize. That's love. In fact, even in the tribulation, his love will continue to shine as he will raise 144,000 evangelists to, to evangelize those who turn their back on Christ. God is a God of long suffering. Why bother? These people, they heard the gospel before the rapture. Why bother again? Just throw them in the lake of fire. That's not God. Long suffering called the same way God shows us long suffering. We fell so many times. God continues to show us long suffering. So the opening of the seventh, the opening of the seventh seal is important. In verse one of our text, the opening of that seventh seal is important. Why? Because from chapter eight, verse one, it will take us all the way to chapter 19 to verse 10, and which will accumulate and they bring to an end this great tribulation. In this seventh seal, as it were, was a kind of an opening gate to the remaining wrath of God. In this seventh seal, we're gonna, we will see seven trumpets. Each trumpet spells out God's wrath, judgment. And at the end of the seventh, at the end, in fact, at the end of the sixth trumpet, there was going to be another pause. It's, it's, progress, it's, it's progression. It has a progression in God's judgment. Each time, the intensity of his, of his judgment increases. So when we get to sixth trumpet, there's going to be another pause. And in that another pause, there'll be a parenthetical, even though it's, it's a very small parenthetical, inserted. And that will open up the seventh seal, or seventh trumpet will open up seven bowls of God's wrath. Bow, just, just think of bow, collected with God's wrath to be poured on the planet Earth, to be poured on the world. It's, it's, I don't, thank God we will not be here. Thank God that you and I will not be here. Again, verse one, and when he broke the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour, for about half an hour. And this brings us to seven angels and the trumpets, seven angels and the trumpets. Verse two, and I saw the seven angels who stand before God and seven trumpets were given to them. Seven trumpets were given to them. And this, this were servants of God. There were literally millions of angels in heaven, if not billions in heaven. And this special seven, for one reason, have special task and special duty in the presence of God. Not every angel was called. These seven were chosen to serve God. I like uh, what Barclay, uh, Barclay uh, said about the opportunity and the privilege to serve God. He put it well. He said, in the heavenly order of things, the greatest honor is to be ever ready to be sent on the service of God. And that is the, and that is the honor these angels possessed. The honor is an honor, it's a privilege to have 
close contact with God in his service. And uh, of course, you and I, we have that privilege already to be serving the most high God, especially ministers, pastors, evangelists, those who missionaries, those who serve God, that's a great honor, the greatest honor that there is to be able to serve the most high God on the planet Earth. And of course, you do too. As a, as a as Christ ambassador, you are also serving heaven wherever you are. It's an honor and a privilege that Jesus Christ has called you to represent him in the devil's world. And how do I know? Because you are a priest. Every believer is a priest. A priest represents man before God. And so you have tremendous privilege of approaching to the throne of God daily. As he tells us in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, let us come boldly before the throne of his grace. Why should you come in the Old Testament? You shouldn't have, you shouldn't dare come to the throne of God's grace. You will be dead upon arrival. Only priests were allowed to approach the altar. But today, every believer has been given the privilege of being a priest, according to 1, Timothy, 1 Peter. We are all, 2 verse 9, we are all priests. And therefore, male and female. In the Old Testament, a female shouldn't even dare assume that name or even come forward to represent God. Only male, males we are chosen in the Old Testament to be priests. No single female was a priest. But in the church, that has been removed. The curtain that separated the Holy of Holies that torn from bottom, from top down when Christ said it is finished. That opened the gate for every person that you as a believer, you don't need to go to anybody to represent you as a priest. You are your own priest. You have access to the throne of God's grace. So the seven angels and seven trumpets uh, is... The trumpets, trumpets in the Old Testament, or, or trumpets in general, play a major role in the plan of God. It, it, it's a trumpet. It was used in the, in the Old Testament. You find it used in so many places. Uh, it was used to call uh, for war or to, to alert people of danger. Uh, to, to gather people. There are many usage, usage, usages of trumpets in the Old Testament. Uh, and it's also used for gathering during the time when God spoke to the people of Israel. In Exodus 19, verse 16, Isaiah 27, 13, Jeremiah 4, 5, just to name a few of the passages where trumpets were used. Uh, it was also it will, it, the trumpet will be used in the day of the Lord, according to Joel chapter two, verse one. And uh, of one, of course, we know the fall of Jericho. The fall of Jericho as a result of seven sounds of trumpets brought down the fall of Jericho. The same way, it, it, which spells out judgment. The same way, these trumpets. They, all of them would spell out judgment upon the world. They will spell out judgment upon the world. Each angel was given a trumpet. And they, 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 you can just visualize them with the trumpets. They, they are all standing to blow their trumpet. The trumpet, the sound of God's judgment coming upon the world. And this brings us to the, uh, to the next three verses, verses three through five, the angel priest. The angel priest, read with me, and another angel came and stood at the altar holding a golden censer, and much incense was given to him that he might add it to the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne, which was before the throne. 
and the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints went up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and he filled it with the fire of the altar and threw it to the earth. And there followed pools of thunder and sounds of flashes of lightning and earthquake. Wow. That's what the people in the world will have coming for them. But we have these seven angels standing with their trumpets. Suddenly, John sees another angel who came uh, with, uh, to, as a priest because uh, offering of incense, the incense here, the sense, the, the, uh, look at it again in verse three, the censer here is a, like a bowl containing hot charcoals. We are hot charcoals is put for the burning of the incense. And so he holds this, which means he is going to enter into intercessory prayer as a mediator. Well, some scholars believe that this, in the, this angel is no other than the angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord. It's, it's not one of the created angels. The angel of the Lord was not created. He himself created all angels as we saw in our study of the book of Hebrews. All angels worship him. So he is the uncreated creator. So the angel of the Lord, uh, there is no way in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation did angels present censer or incense before the altar of God. None. So we, we, we come to the we come to the conclusion then that this angel does what Paul tells us in 1 Timothy 2, 5. He does intercessory. He's an, he, he, he does intercessory work. He's interceding for, not for the church, the church is already in heaven, but for believers, the Jewish believers and the other believers in, on earth during the tribulation. Believers who we are praying, believers who are going through difficult times, as we saw in the closing of our of chapter seven and the six, during the time of the great of the tribulation of the 144,000 and many souls killed that John saw. So these were prayers of saints being collected. And the mediator of Jesus himself, the Messiah, being the mediator between the praying saints and God. And that only him fits in this mode of description, being a mediator. Uh, Jesus Christ, as an angel of the Lord, featured before his incarnation. He featured, he, he appeared before Abraham. He appeared before Moses. He, he appeared over and over before Joshua and uh, and he was the one leading Israel into the promised land, the angel of the Lord. And so here again, he features as the angel of the Lord. Why? Why? Because Israel has been called, called up. It's kind of going back to the uh, Jewish, er, Jewish age, if you would. Remember I said, Israel at the present time Oh, owes God seven years. Israel is still owing God seven years. No matter, no matter what happens, Israel must pay back seven years to God. And that seven years of service will be done in tribulation. That's why 144,000 will be raised to evangelize that, this world. It's going to happen. It's going to take place. I don't care what, no matter what happens, no matter what the word dictates Israel must be here to fulfill that seven years. No human being on earth can eradicate Israel. And no sophisticated weaponry can 
clear up Israel on this planet Earth. Israel will always be here until Jesus returns. <laughs> that's, that, that's a monument of the faithfulness of God. If that doesn't, if that doesn't shake you about God, nothing else could, nothing else would, if the existence of Israel doesn't cause your hairs to stand in the erection, right. nothing else would I know that about that. Nothing else. Israel will be here. Rain, sun, whatever. Just look at the history of Israel and see how many, how many dictators have tried to wipe them off of the planet Earth. How many? No matter the amount of hatredness they show toward these people, God preserved them and they are still here. They, 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 Nebuchadnezzar didn't finish them up. God preserved them and will continue to preserve them because of his faithfulness. No wonder why Jeremiah can say, this I recall to mind, therefore I have hope. It is of the lost mercies that we are not consumed for his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. He can look to, his, to their record. He can flip back and forth and he can come to one conclusion. God is faithful. God is faithful. The same way he was faithful or he is faithful to Israel, so shall he be faithful to every servant and every believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. He will be faithful to you no matter what. He will be faithful. Jesus, the Messiah, the angel of the Lord, appeared not only to Abraham, but he also interceded for Joshua in the book of Zechariah. He interceded for Joshua as, an, as a, an, a mediator. As a mediator. So the, in verse 3 through 5, we see Jesus Christ being represented here as angel. You can call him angel priest. Angel priest serving God as a mediator. And it shows us the importance of prayer. And don't, don't overlook this privilege you and I have. Prayer is so crucial, so powerful, so needful. We're not praying enough. I can assure you that. We're not praying enough. I don't care how much you pray, you're not praying enough. Yeah. Prayer. You see how prayers of the saints are preserved? How prayers of the saints are treated before God? Being channeled through uh, aroma of incense, burning by the Lord Jesus Christ. And that prayer for rescue, prayer that the saints on earth will be praying, is going to be answered in a dramatic way. Judgment coming upon their torturers. Judgment coming upon the world. And this that brings us to verse 6, six and 7 in our text. Uh, the censor here symbolizes, of course, God's judgment. Verse 6 and 7. And look at verse 5 again. And the angel took the censor, that's Jesus himself, the angel of the Lord, took the, the censor and threw it to the earth. And there followed pros of thunder and sounds and flashes of lightning and earthquake, symbols of judgment. He just collected all these things, groom, signifying even the answer, the prayer of the saints answered. The earth, this, this earth, once the church is removed and the Holy Spirit, the restrainer is removed, the church gets into being, the, the earth will remain in the mercy of God. Verse six and seven. And the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound them. Now they are ready. Visualize the, angel, the seven angels holding their trumpets. They've been holding and waiting. Now they are ready to begin sounding the trumpets. Remember, these are this, this, uh, the trumpets that 
the entire heaven was silent for 30 minutes. That means the intensity of what was to come, the intensity of judgment, the intensity of discipline, you know, of punishment coming on the world was so grave that God paused. It's like a, as, as, if, as if he doesn't want to see what, what, what he was about to do, do to the world, as if he was looking the other way. He didn't want to, he doesn't want to, the same way he doesn't want to see his son screaming on the cross for three hours. He didn't want to look at his face as he was crying. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you forsaken me? Ultimately, ultimately justice will reign. Verse six and seven again. Um, and the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound them. And the first sounded, here we go. Now we begin the judgment of the seven trumpets, verse seven. And the first sounded and there came hell and fire mixed with blood. And they were thrown to the earth and the third of the earth was burned up and a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. <laughs> we know about the carbon dioxide and the grass and the, what all those things do when they are released in the atmosphere. We know about all these things if you, you've been following this uh, global warming people. They don't know about global, global warming until they see the tribulation, then they will understand the meaning of global warming. It will really be hot. Right now, it's not hot at all. Global warming is coming in the tribulation. And those who reject Christ now will face his wrath in the tribulation. And Jesus continues to show us the way. And the first sounded and there came hell and fire. And this is this many scholars or many Bible expositors, they try to, especially those who don't believe in the in, in the book of Revelation, literally, they try to symbolize and spiritualize. No, these are literal. These are literal. There is a parallel to verse seven. You, we see blood, uh, blood, uh, they were thrown to the earth and the third of the earth was burned up and the third of the trees were burned up. In verse, uh, look back to verse seven. And the first sounded and there came hell and fire mixed with blood and they were thrown in on the earth mixed with the blood. You find, you say, where does the blood come from? Where does the blood come from? Well, if uh, when I was searching through, there, there has been a, an incident in 1901 when, when uh, such thing happened. Not that it's not what you are seeing here is not something that hasn't happened. In 1901 in Europe, when uh, there was a hell and some kind, they were seeing the rain fall, mixing like a blood, mixing with the Sahara uh, sand that was just uh, unbearable for people at that time. Uh, but this is that, that incident of 1901 is just a, is, is, is a scratch compared to what John is revealing to us. That's exactly God is going to turn this world upside down by way of judgment. It happened literally so there is no need to to uh, there is no need not to take this literal because it did happen in the time of Israel. Turn with me to Exodus, Exodus chapter nineteen, verse sixteen. To um, I'm sorry, Exodus chapter nine. In Exodus chapter nine the people of uh, Israel had experienced, they experienced this 
hell. Uh, God was literal. Exodus 9, verse 16. Uh, just skip to verse 18. Behold, about this time tomorrow, I will send a very heavy hell such as has not been seen in Egypt from the day it was founded until now. Now therefore send, bring your livestock and whatever you have in the field to safety. Every man and beast that is found in the field and is not brought home, when the hell comes down on them will die. The one among the servants of, e of Pharaoh who feared the word of the Lord made his servants and his livestock flee into the houses. But he who paid no regard to the word of the Lord left his servants and his livestock in the field. Now the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward the sky that hell may fall on all the land of Egypt, on man and on beast and on every plant of the field throughout the land of Egypt. And Moses stretched out his head, staff toward the sky. And the Lord sent thunder and hell and fire ran down to the earth. And the Lord rained hell on the land of Egypt. So there was hell and fire flashing continually in the midst of all the hell, very severe, such as had not been in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation. And the hell struck all that was in the field through all the land of Egypt, both man and beast. The hell also struck every plant of the field and shattered every tree of the field. I guess verse 26 is very uh, exciting. Only in the land of Goshen, where the sons of Israel were, there was no single hell. God knows where you are. And he will protect you in the time of calamity. God never disciplines or punishes the righteous with the unrighteous. That was the dialogue between Abraham and God, when God was about to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, will you destroy the righteous with the unrighteous? He, his, of course, his mind was on Lot, his nephew. God said, no, I wouldn't do that. In Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 12 through, through 16, God does the same thing. He said, when he sends plague in the land, uh, famine in the land. He, he, if those three people were in it, Noah, uh, Daniel, uh, Job, by their own righteousness, they will save themselves. My friend, as so long as you are living a life that is honoring to God, God will shatter you from evil. He will not blend you along with the world. He will not bring uh, disaster upon you when he is punishing the world. And so you can be sure of that. God finds a way to keep his people secured. God has a way of protecting and providing for his people in times of calamities. And we see it here in uh, Exodus, perfect example. Goshen, we are the, we are the community of Israel where they, God gave them, Pharaoh gave them to, to leave their camp, if you will. But they all, the rest of the country suffered tremendously under God's punishment. But he spared his people. Not a single hair. So God knows the boundary. You are boundary. And you can be sure of one thing. You will continue to enjoy his safety. You will continue to enjoy his protection. You will continue to enjoy his abundance of blessing as you, as, as you pioneer your life toward glorification of our Lord Jesus Christ. That should, be, that should give us comfort. No matter what is happening, you should never be overburdened by the 
happenings around you. You should not be concerned about the, the political atmosphere of your country or the world in general. Jesus Christ controls history. As a child of God, fear you not, for the Lord stands by to rescue, to help, to provide, to meet your daily needs as they arise. So long you are living a life of obedience. He cannot, he will not falter. He cannot fail you. That's not his character. No, come what may, he will be there. He may delay. That doesn't mean he doesn't have a plan. Just because he doesn't do it right now doesn't mean he will not do it tomorrow. Even when he delays, there's a reason why he delays. At, at last, you look, up, look back and say, God, thank you for the delay. Just stay where you are. Stay put, as they will say, and continue to trust God. Open your life to God. He cannot falter. He cannot fail you. Not now, not ever. So the judgment, the judgment, uh, this judgment we just overlooked here, the point is great. And no matter great, no, even though it's so great, my friend, it's nothing compared to what is yet to come. It's just a scratch. What we just, this first trumpet is just a scratch. What God has prepared for the world who rejected Jesus Christ is not worthy to mention. It's not worthy of discussion. There's right to come. While we are alive, let us warn those around us. Because the Bible says, if you don't, your blood will be upon you. Their blood will be upon you. And that's why Peter, you know, that's why Paul said, I have warned you, your blood is not on my head. Ezekiel warned us, don't keep your mouth, don't zip your mouth. When God creates an opportunity for you to share the gospel, share the gospel. That's the meaning of an ambassador. We are an ambassador of Jesus Christ. If you think, just to think of what God has come into those who rejected Christ. You, you might want to move you to share the gospel whenever the opportunity presents itself. Whenever you have the time I call upon my brother, uh, Dr. Darlington, to close us in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we are grateful to you because you love us so much. We can't even fathom the depth and the, of your love. We're grateful, Father. Thank you, O oh God, because you have not... Uh, elected us as children of wrath. Heavenly Father, we are delighted, O oh God, because you did not leave us in darkness regarding the plan that you have for the future. But Father, our hearts are saddened because there are so many people who are not yet paying heed to what your plan is and who are not conscious of the fact that Yes, you are a merciful God. You are a loving Father. And yet, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hand of God because you are also a consuming fire. Father, we do pray, O oh God, tonight that you cause all of us, O oh God, to be zealous in warning all the people around us about the impending danger if they do not turn their lives to you. Father, we pray, oh God, that their eyes, the scales in their eyes might fall off for them to recognize, oh God, that it is not your will that any one of us, any one of them should perish, but that they all will come to repentance. Lord, as we warn them, cause us, oh God, to be careful and, I, and follow the admonition of our brother Paul to encourage each other with these things as we see the days draw nearer and nearer all the time. 
Father, we thank you, O oh God, for your servant, Reverend Moses, that you have used and you continue to use to expose this truth to all of us. Lord, we pray, O oh God, for a blessing upon him. Pray for more grace. We pray, O oh God, that you encourage his heart. We pray, O oh God, that you keep him in real good and robust health. And that you, pray, you, you, you just bless him, O oh God, and uh, provide every need of his as he continues to labor with great love in your vineyard. Lord, there are so many who tuned in from different parts of the globe. We pray, oh God, that you bless them Amen. based on your promise. Be thou exalted, Father, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. And thank you for tuning in. Until uh, next time. Right.